Well, thank you all for being here. My name is Chris Crawford. I am a program associate at Democracy Fund. We are a foundation established by eBay founder Piero Midyar to help ensure that the American people come first in our democracy. For the past year, we've partnered with the Georgetown Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life for a series of dialogues on faith, democracy, and the common good. We're also happy to sponsor tonight's event with the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service. To understand our shifting political coalitions in this country, we must better understand the place of faith and the role of the faithful in our political system. If we are to improve democracy and make it more responsive to the American people, it's vital that we take a closer look at the way in which faith and culture drive our politics, and it's vital for us to understand the way politics sometimes drive our faith. Tonight, we will discuss faith and the faithful in the Republican Party. This has been discussed quite a bit over the last three years, and the topic requires a diverse set of voices to do it justice. Tonight's panel features a set of speakers who each define the Republican Party and their relationship to the party in very different terms. There are few places that could bring together such an engaging panel, and this is why we are so proud to partner with our friends at Georgetown. Now in its fifth year, the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life has organized more than 40 gatherings with more than 16,000 participants. From the Catholic perspective, looking out toward the world, they have become a respected host of discussions of national and global importance. They hope to encourage a new generation of faithful leaders who are the salt, light, and leaven of our public life. We are especially grateful for the whole team here at the initiative and for John Carr in particular. As you probably already know, John Carr served for more than 20 years as the director of the Department of Peace, Justice, and Human Development at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. He has a longer bio that you all know, so I'm going to skip it. But I'd like to say <laughs> instead that John has been in the arena for difficult conversations on both sides of the political aisle, and he has the scars to prove it. He is a tireless advocate for people who are poor and marginalized. And he does this while avoiding partisan political traps and by encouraging civil discourse and deeper understanding. As a fellow Catholic, I can say that John Carr and this initiative and the whole team here offer the very best of the Catholic Church. So we're very excited to be here and you can take it away, John. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chris. I want to thank Chris and our friends at the Democracy Fund, not only for their support, which is crucial, but uh, for two things. Uh, one is, at a time when lots of us complain uh, about dysfunction and polarization and the lack of civility, uh, the Democracy Fund invests in trying to provide ways to overcome uh, those uh, maladies and ways to bring people together. And secondly, at a time when many people see faith as a source of division only, uh, or part of the polarization, they understand that uh, faith at its best brings people together and provides a moral vocabulary and framework to pursue the common good. So both those things are in short supply in this city and this country, so we're very grateful. Uh, this is, as Chris mentioned, this is the second of our three dialogues on faith and the faithful. How many people were at the, the first one we did? That's great. Thank you for coming back. For those of you uh, that uh, this is your first one, welcome. The third one will be roughly a month from now on faith and the faithful in the Democratic Party. That ought to be fairly interesting. Uh, Michael Gerson, we were talking about this, said, uh, I don't know how you'll fill the time. Uh, it ought to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, a couple uh, sort of distinctions or disclaimers. We deliberately sought a wide range of perspectives here. Uh, I, I was saying to Linda, uh, my, my Republican mother would be so proud 
that <laughs> I am uh, part of this. I come from a mixed marriage. Both my parents were Minnesota Catholics, but my uh, mother's family from St. Paul, my dad's from Minneapolis, a bigger deal. Uh, my mother's family Republican, my dad's Democrat. But she would be so proud, and she would say, this sort of looks like the Republican Party. A couple evangelicals, a Catholic, a libertarian, a journalist <laughs> watching over us, more men than women. Uh, <laughs> And uh, she would want to see uh, sort of where, the, where all this goes. But uh, we, we did not, and I want to be clear about this, we did not invite the people who think there can be no compatibility between faith, the faithful, and the Republican Party. <coughs> there are people in our country and in our religious communities who think you cannot be a good Democrat and be a believer or a Catholic or an evangelical or you can't be a Trump supporter, a Republican, and hold fast to the uh, positions of our faith. Uh, we don't buy that, and we have people here who in different ways, uh, with different perspectives, express that. So we want a full range of that. So we have a lot to work with. Uh, Julia uh, did a story just, uh, uh, what, 10 days ago? on the firing and rehiring of uh, the Catholic chaplain, uh, whether there is an anti-Catholic anti uh, conversation going on in some parts of the Republican Party. The, uh, uh, the alliance between Trump, the Republican Party, and evangelicals is a subject of uh, vigorous debate. Uh, Michael wrote a long article, people respond to, Johnny is in the middle of that conversation. Uh, there is a religious resistance to Trump and the Republican Party on a wide range of issues. Uh, you, there's a demonstration of your choice over the next uh, few weeks, on whether it's on immigration, on race, on uh, uh, a whole range of issues. Uh, and as the Democratic Party has become more secular, and some would say more intolerant of religious views, it seems, to me at least, that the Republican Party has become more dependent on religious voters, uh, particularly white Christians. And we ought to forget that uh, white people are not the only Christians, that African American and Latino Christians are a huge part of the Democratic coalition. <laughs> And others can make the case uh, for the coalitions that uh, uh, are at work in both parties. Uh, some issues bring different parts of the religious community together, whether it's uh, abortion, the defense of unborn children, whether it's religious liberty, whether it's uh, defense of the family. On the other hand, it might be immigration or race or economic justice. Uh, one thing that strikes me is probably, and this is something you covered, we are a long way from Pope Francis uh, before the United States Congress, where both parties came together uh, to hear a message about uh, dialogue, about compromise, about principle. And now we appear to be in a period of enormous polarization, a good deal of anger, and considerable religious conflict. Conflict. So, having said that, my first question is a very general one to each of you, and then I'll introduce you. After the 216 election, and the current, and in this current context, is this popping off a lot? Yeah, reminds me of the story, great story of a. Uh, uh, an Irish pastor who was using one of these lavalier mics for the first time. And he, he was convinced it wouldn't work. It, you know, same deal, the front pews were empty. <laughs> uh, he goes, uh, there's something wrong with this microphone. He says, the Lord be with you. And there's something wrong with this microphone. And of course, the people responded, and also with you. <laughs> so I, I hope the microphone's working. So here's the question, and then I'll introduce our panel. After this. 2016 election. And in this current context, which I tried to describe, what is the most important or the most surprising development at the intersection of faith and politics, especially 
on the place of faith and the faithful in the Republican Party. And with that, I'll introduce briefly and informally uh, each of our uh, panelists. I want to begin with Johnny Moore. Uh, Johnny, uh, there are not many people who worked in Liberty University in Hollywood uh, <laughs> and were successful at both. Uh, he, we wanted a representative of uh, the evangelical leaders who are close to the president, and we got the person who in many ways, according to the Washington Post, is the gatekeeper, the bridge builder, in uh, creating the evangelical council, which advises the pope. He is probably best known for his defense of uh, religious liberty and the rights of Christians around the world. He's written a new book called The Martyr's Oath. Um, he uh, is a pastor. He is a PR executive. He is a businessman. He is somebody who has, in his own way, and, it, and of course, uh, there are those who think it's the greatest thing in the world and the worst, has tried to uh, connect the evangelical voters who supported the president so strongly with the administration that they put into office. So that's Johnny. He, uh, he's a member of the National Association of Evangelicals Board and a lot of other groups. And I want to thank Galen Carey for helping get Johnny here. Johnny may be passed up uh, the most. I'm very grateful to everybody for being here. But Johnny passed up a trip to Jerusalem uh, mm -hmm. Uh, on a government plane with a lot of big shots to be with us tonight, and I'm glad uh, that she did. Uh, Julia is a religion reporter at the Washington Post. Uh, there are a lot of things that are not going great in religion and public life, at least in my view. One of the really good things that's going on is the Washington Post has invested in first-rate coverage of religion and public life. Uh, a lot of you know Michelle Borstein has been a part of our thing, Sarah Pulliam Bailey, and now Julia Zomer, Dosmer, I never say that right, has joined that team, and if you've been reading her, she covered the chaplaincy uh, controversy. My favorite story she did was on a dreamer priest mm -hmm. in Atlanta, uh, a priest who uh, is actually uh, able to serve because of the DACA program. Another story was explaining to middle school students why they might want to be a religious sister. Uh, she's covered the religious right, she's covered the religious left, uh, she's covered the visit of Pope Francis. The things I found most interesting about uh, Julia is one, uh, she uh, speaks Latin. And my question, what is a good Jewish girl doing <laughs> speaking Latin? I mean, I took four years of Latin and I can't say a word. You know, uh, but uh, she was also on Jeopardy and did really well, so she's really smart. And as uh, somebody with six grandchildren, she is uh, a balloon sculpture. How, what do you call it? Twisting? Balloon twister. And, and I'm signing her up. Uh, <laughs> that will pay better than this. Uh, but she is not a Republican leader. She is an observer of uh, the Republican Party and can help us understand this. Ramesh is somebody we, Ramesh is somebody we've been trying to get here for a while. He uh, has several outlets. He's been at National Review for 20 years. He's part of the Bloomberg Syndicate. He shows up on PBS. He uh, has been somebody who has been a powerful defender of human life, written a couple wonderful pieces about uh, uh, the, the young child in England, uh, Alfie Evans. Uh, he uh, grew up in Kansas. The, I think your father was Hindu and your mother Lutheran. So of course you became a Catholic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, he had a wonderful interview with America Magazine where he talked about that choice and uh, uh, you took Francis Xavier as your confirmation name. Uh, so somebody who went into the tough situation, so a conservative Catholic in Washington, Francis Xavier may be a good uh, name. He said uh, being a Catholic knocks off some of the edges, maybe, of your commentary. He uh, 
Uh, it affected his position on the death penalty. But he is one of the most thoughtful uh, and recognized conservative commentators uh, here in Washington. Emily uh, Eaton is a pollster. She will help us uh, share something more than opinions, actually some facts. She works at Cato, a libertarian think tank here. She works uh, particularly on millennials and on uh, she has a wonderful piece. She's part of the voter uh, panel that our friends at the Democracy Fund have put together. And she has uh, the five types of Trump voters. We're all trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, you have actually uh, thought and written about that. One of her articles I love is, Millennials love socialism until they get a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, which uh, <laughs> describes one of my children. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Gerson is known to many of us for his work in the Bush White House, uh, where he was an assistant to the president. He was uh, a principal speechwriter. Uh, Michael is, in many ways, the architect and the articulator of compassionate conservatism. What you may not know is he has a PBS show in principle uh, that's on now. And his first interview uh, show I saw was with President George W. Bush who he served, and in that show they talked about PEPFAR, which may be the most remarkable example of compassionate conservatism. Because of Michael, because of President Bush, there are literally, literally millions of uh, people in Africa who have lived to see uh, their children grow up. Uh, the other area I worked uh, with Michael on was the refundability of the children's tax credit. I know that's a priority for Ramesh as well. Uh, it'd be fair to say Michael is not uh, an enthusiastic uh, supporter of the Evangelical Trump Alliance. Uh, <laughs> he has been a pretty consistent critic, uh, both on character and policy grounds. Uh, the, so we have a range on that. Uh, one of the things I'm most grateful for, we do a session with uh, young leaders in Washington. And at the first one we did, we had John Favreau, who was a speechwriter for Barack Obama, and Michael Gerson, who was speechwriter for George W. Bush. And I forget what the title was. It was some pompous, you know, institute sort of <laughs> title. But the, what they talked about was how not to lose your faith and your hope in Washington. And Michael has been a voice uh, leader of the Sanity Caucus for a long time. So let's go back after those long uh, informal introductions. Since this election, in this context, what is the most surprising or the most important thing about the relationship between faith and the faithful and the Republican Party? And why don't I turn to you, Emily, to start? Of course. Well, Thank you again for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, as John mentioned, um, I'm, I work at the Cato Institute. We're a nonpartisan think tank, and we've been doing a lot of research on voters and opinion trends, particularly those surrounding the 2016 election. Um, and in answer to your question, I think that there um, are two factors that are kind of coming together that had a really major impact on the 2016 election. The first is a dramatic increase in the number of people who are leaving organized religion and don't identify with a particular religious denomination. Since the 90s, that number has quadrupled around, among the general public, but has tripled among Republicans. Um, so that, that trend is applying to Republican voters, not just um, you know, the nation overall. And then the second, and this one I think might surprise many um, of our viewers today, is um, that religion seems to play a moderating force when it comes to issues of tolerance, of difference, particularly when it comes to race, immigration, and living in a more diverse, multicultural society. Um, I'd like to give some examples to explain what I mean by this. Um, as part of the data that we collected with the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group, we had a large survey we conducted of 8,000 voters. And because it was such a large survey, we were able to have large, um, large numbers of people who attend church a lot, a little bit, 
occasionally or not at all. And we're able to compare and contrast how those types of voters think about different issues. So I specifically looked at Trump voters, people who voted for Trump, and those who uh, um, attend church more than once a week, once a week, once a month, maybe once a year, you know, Easter or Christmas, or never at all. And what we find is that people who attend church more regularly tend to have more favorable opinions of racial minorities, African Americans and Hispanics, compared to Trump voters that never attend church. We also find that people who attend church regularly are more likely to support making it easier to immigrate to, to the United States and to provide a pathway to citizenship for those who are um, to unauthorized immigrants living in the US, more by about 20 to 30 points, more so than Trump voters that never attend church. Similarly, we found the same thing when it came to the travel ban. People who, had, um, Trump voters who attend church regularly are far less likely, about half as likely, to support a travel ban um, on Muslims entering the United States compared to Trump voters that never attend church. Um, and then similarly, when it comes to, um, when we ask people how important is it to accept people from diverse backgrounds, religious and racial backgrounds, um, Trump voters who attend church regularly are about more than twice as likely to say it's very important to do so. And this really surprised a lot of um, observers of the data because um, kind of the stereotype is that those who attend church are less tolerant um, when in fact we're actually seeing the opposite be the case. And I think part of what's going on is that when it comes to favorable attitudes towards gay and lesbian people, the more frequently someone a conservative attends church, the less likely they are to have warm feelings towards them. But that does not hold up when it comes to looking at racial minorities, religious minorities, and not just when it comes to issues of tolerance. Um, concern about poverty is um, also was significantly higher among Trump voters who attend church regularly. So the point that I'd like to make is that religion seems to be playing a moderating force within the conservative movement among Trump voters, but at the same time, fewer Republicans are attending church regularly. So the very force that could actually moderate some of these culture war conflicts is receding. And I think that that is contributing a lot to what we saw play out in the 2016 election. Thank you, that's fascinating. We, at, when we were doing work on the death penalty, our pollster was very surprised to find out that people shifted their position against the death penalty based on how often they went to church. And his assumption was it was reversed. Michael, one thing I left out of your introduction which I wanted to add is you apparently spent a year at Georgetown before going to Wheaton. Yeah. Uh, two very similar institutions <laughs> in every way. Uh, over coffee, maybe we could talk about that. But sure. what, what do you think is the most significant development in terms of faith in the faithful and the GOP? Well, uh, clearly the most surprising is that thou shalt not commit sex with a porn star is an optional commitment <laughs> among uh, uh, evangelicals nowadays. Um, but, uh, and that's a plus for a lot of people. I would say that the, the most surprising thing that really, um, that struck me was how wrong I was. In, Around the year 2010, Pete Weiner and I uh, wrote a book called City of Man, where we postulated that the model of, the, of social engagement of the religious right was reaching its um, exhaust, was re reaching exhaustion. Um, that uh, something new and better was in the offing, that old leaders and old institutions were passing. Um, and I had seen some evidence of that when working with uh, religious groups on issues like global AIDS or malaria or um, uh, other issues that seem to broaden the range of social concern. Um, and, uh, but I think we saw something very different in, in 2016, different than what I expected. You saw from a lot of evangelicals a fairly apocalyptic tone. You know, Pat Robertson said that this if uh, Hillary Clinton won, this would be one of the last elections for, for Republicans. Um, 
And, uh, and you had a lot of evangelicals that were convinced that this was really an important cultural turning point moment. Um, and that um, the binary choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump represented a very fundamental choice about the direction of the country, I think. Um, I think you had people that uh, felt besieged in a broader cultural context. Um, and that, that uh, they turned to someone they regarded as a strong leader, as essentially a bully to fight the bullies. Um, and you had that explicitly stated by some evangelical leaders that that was um, uh, where things were headed. Um, and you also saw uh, arguments that were explicitly utilitarian in, in character, which is, you know, the, not, I, I wouldn't say cynical, but very realistic, um, arguing that I'm going to get a certain amount of benefits for the support of a certain candidate who I view as deeply flawed. Um, and I think that they were willing to, to make that uh, trade um, in, a, in a way that was, uh, that was unexpected to me. Um, my concern as we move along is that evangelicals have now, by becoming the base of Trump's base, have identified themselves closely with the president and his future. Um, and I think are seen by the broader culture, white evangelicals, as the most loyal elements of that coalition and will in many ways share in its fate um, the way that the public views it more broadly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was supposed to mention this earlier. We're very happy that uh, we're being broadcast on C-SPAN this evening. So there are lots of people uh, enjoying this conversation. And for those who wish to, either here or on C-SPAN, you can join the conversation on Twitter at GUCST Public Life and use our hashtag uh, Faith and Politics. So Ramesh, what's the most important, surprising, significant in the GOP and religious voters? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it is the most important or uh, um, surprising development, but I do think there's an interesting feature of our religious and moral politics that has, that certainly I didn't foresee, and that has gone uh, underappreciated. Um, and that is that President Trump seems to have a lot of running room on the policy agenda of the social right precisely because nobody believes that he cares about it. Uh, there, you know, when, when Trump changed the policy on um, uh, international family planning by executive order, as, as it's been a ping pong uh, between administrations, um, there was an outcry that he cut off organizations that advocate or perform abortions. Um, but it was nothing like what you saw when George W. Bush did the same thing, and I don't think it was anything like what you would have seen had President Pence been there uh, and Im implemented the exact same policy. Uh, and I think it's because um, while many people think, uh, when many people, when they think of Trump, they think of a lot of negative things, but what they don't think is religious zealot, they don't think holier than thou. They don't think self-righteous. All of those traits were more easily attached to George W. Bush. They would be more, they still are more easily attached to Pence. And I think in a way it, it makes it easier for him to implement a conservative social agenda. And it's one of the reasons why people who had this sort of transactional attitude towards Trump are getting some of the things that they wanted out of this relationship also increasing their influence within the Republican Party is the fact that this administration is much less focused than most American administrations have been at getting the support of 50 plus percent of the country. Uh, a good day in this administration is 42 percent approval. Um, when you are thinking in base, uh, when you're thinking about base politics in that way, it's a very different universe. You know, you've got a lot of strategic options that would not have been open to an administration that was playing by some of the old rules. Um, so th those are some of the things that I think are contributing to the situation in which religious conservatism 
and I'm saying this as somebody who's sympathetic to a lot of religious conservative policy objectives, has less and less purchase with the public in general, um, but has more and more sway within the governing party of the United States. Julia, uh. you've been watching this, uh, covering it. Uh, one of the stories I uh, remember is immediately after the election, uh, people were finding a church or going back to church, some to celebrate, others to pray uh, for deliverance. Uh, you've covered the Pope, you've covered the, the House. What is your take on where things are with the GOP and religious voters? Yeah, I did have a very memorable night at church, at a, an evangelical church about an hour plus outside of DC um, with a large number of Trump voters the night after the election in 2016. And they had a service of Thanksgiving, basically. And talking to these people, it was so clear how relieved they were. And it wasn't because they thought that President Trump was one of them, or was religious, or was in keeping with the values that they espouse in their community, but they felt like they, I think you used the word besieged, Michael, that they had been, one of the phrases that comes up a lot is the culture. And they talked about the culture is moving away from them for eight years of the Obama administration. They felt like the culture was embracing gay marriage, and then it was, transgender bathroom laws and that it was getting farther and farther away from their culture and that they saw a way to win with President Trump. Not that he was one of them, but that they would win with him and they felt like they did. Um, but I think for me as a religion reporter the past two years, what's been interesting is not just how religious people vote and how politicians respond to concerns of people of faith, but how politics is actually changing faith communities themselves and how religious identity has become so wrapped up in political identity in a way that I think is really accelerating under the Trump administration. Um, and we see that in Catholic parishes, which is among the few places in America nowadays where you really find people of vastly different political opinions in one congregation. That is becoming exceptionally rare. And it still exists in Catholic parishes, and it's a real challenge for a lot of parishes. Um, and we especially see it in evangelical communities, where the word evangelical has come to equal Republican for so many people. And there are, you know, if, even if 80% of white evangelicals voted for President Trump, 20% of white evangelicals is an enormous number of people. Um, it, the white evangelicals are something like 25% of the country, depending how you count. So 20% of them not voting for Trump. It's a huge number of people, and so many of them are no longer comfortable calling themselves evangelical at all. And there's this huge group of ex-evangelicals. And of course, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you leave the term because you're not a Trump supporter, all of a sudden everyone who's evangelical is a Trump supporter. And the way that politics and religion are becoming an equal label, that you can ask somebody what their faith group is and you sort of know their politics or vice versa, is really, I think, a distinct change in the past few years that we're seeing accelerating. Julie's been watching this. You've been in the <laughs> middle of this. Uh, what, I want to say what has that experience been like, but uh, let's stick with the question, which is, <laughs> What's been the most interesting, most important, surprising thing about these last, this last year and a half from your efforts? Uh, well, I would, um, yeah, I'm going to stick to the question and okay. not you know, answer uh, <laughs> other things said here. But uh, there are four simple things, actually, from, from my perspective. Um, the first is uh, the resurrection of this idea of co-belligerency, which, uh, as a Liberty University student, is something I learned uh, when I was working with Jerry Falwell Sr. You know, when, when, you know, I, I spent 13 years at Liberty University. I started working there when I was 19 years old. I was the campus pastor at the school. And you know, one of the things that we learned you know, about the role that, and way that Jerry Falwell engaged in the 1980s in the public square was um, you know, it, the moral majority was that. It was the moral majority. You know, it wasn't evangelicals. It was evangelicals and Catholics and Jews and atheists. And you know, across the board, it was if you could agree on a few of these principles or even one of the principles, you could move forward together. And you know, it's something he got from his mentor, Francis Schaeffer, which he got from Carl Henry. And it's something that we 
we really got, I think, as young evangelicals at, at, at Liberty University, that we don't have to agree on everything in order to work together on one thing. You know, so, so I remember coming here, you know, the first time I ever learned about the amazing work of Michael Gerson was attending the International AIDS Conference here in Washington, D.C. Because for me, it was like, and nothing else mattered. You know, it was just this one thing we could work together on. And I think, you know, uh, co-belligerency is, is what we saw. It, it, it died for a period of time after Jerry Falwell's death where you had leaders on the right, sort of religious right, swing to the right. So they would, no candidate was pure enough for them to endorse in the election. They'd end up in every primary, they, they'd end up not endorsing someone and that person would end up the candidate. And I, I think you saw unusual alliances that were united together with this idea. And then very quickly, um, number two, the staying power of evangelicals in the conversation. I mean, evangelicals have sort of, I think, at least the parlance that I hear in conversations with a lot of these people is they're used to being a very pivotal in elections and then it's like, say, see you in four years. Um, and that has, not, that has not been the case. You know, I, I uh, um, uh, have, have tried to manage this faith and hope in DC problem by not living in DC. I still live in Southern California and I've been fully expecting to not have to come here so frequently just as a, as a private citizen. But this is a White House that wants to continue to hear from uh, from, from this community. So I've been personally a part of between 700 and 1,000 evangelicals sitting in listening sessions in the White House. Um, the, the third thing is something that's been said here twice already, which is the moderating force of evangelicals in the conversation. And you know, this is sort of lost. Um, in fact, I'm heartened to hear it said here because I feel like it's lost in the sort of tabloidization of, of a news coverage with due respect, Julie, and I'm not speaking of you or your paper, but you know, sometimes your paper, um, where <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, the fact is, is that evangelicals, okay, and I speak not out of opinion, I speak as an eyewitness, okay, evangelicals, the conservative ones, okay, have played a moderating force on issues like DACA, on the prison reform conversation that's happening last week and happening this week, uh, you know, largely supportive of, of family leave, which I think will come up in the DACA, you know, in, in the next few months. You know, evangelicals have played a huge role you know, in, in the opioid conversation. I, I, I sat in a meeting in the White House with, with you know, 50 leading mental health uh, professionals all across the country, you know, and a lot of them it was their faith that drew them into the conversation. You know, the, the, it seems totally out of the, part, you know, the discussion because it's not about abortion or you know, religious freedom. But, but the cost of drugs, you know, I've sat in meetings with, with religious leaders saying, because I'm a pastor and I have a congregation, and I have people that are suffering in this way, this matters to us too. And so I think evangelicals have played a, a moderating force. And the, and the last, last point I'll say in a sentence, because I don't want to, I don't want to break, break any rule here, but. Um, uh, Catholic, I, we're, we're a little loose on that. <laughs> uh, the, the last thing I'll say is I have been surprised, frankly, um, by the unwillingness uh, of some involved in the resistance, whatever that is, to work with people like me and other evangelicals on issues of mutual concern. You know, and that's why I was so heartened um, also you know, by, uh, by this conversation, the work that you've done in this, and this uh, center has done for so long. Uh, because the, the fact is, is that um, you know, if we're not careful, we'll sort of read and believe our own headlines about ourselves. And what has marked evangelicals, at least in the last couple of years, those close to this administration, is they've just been focused whatever else is going on. That was fascinating. Let me uh, pursue a theme here. Moderation, uh, moderation. Uh, the policies of the party don't seem to me to be very moderate right now. Uh, on immigration, uh, we had the chief of staff say the other day that these uh, Irish Catholic say that these people that are coming uh, don't seem to fit in very well, they're not educated, they don't speak the language, which has a familiar ring to uh, Catholics a couple generations ago. And if, you, uh, if you're gonna separate uh, mothers and children, maybe there'll be foster care. So uh, what is the obligation, and this is sort of, uh, it'll be a question in the democratic discussion as well, when do you build bridges and when do you stand up? Uh, when, how do you take this moderation and have it lead to action? Because right now on immigration, we seem much further away from where President Bush and Michael were pushing us, even where President Trump was months ago on uh, Muslims and refugees. We see, I've been working on this for a long time. It seems tougher than it's ever been. And my, 
my Republican mother and a lot of the Republican members I know seem to have signed up for an agenda that they don't really have their heart in. How did this take over the party? Can I weigh in? Sure. Um, so I'd like to dovetail what you were saying into yeah. a point I was making about the increasing numbers of people who have left organized religion over the past two decades. Yeah. I think that that is playing a role. It's by no means the only thing, but I think it's playing a role. And what research has shown is that pe particularly conservatives, um, people who have a desire for community, if they're not getting that community from some sort of you know, church, synagogue, mosque, or whatever it is, they're going to look for it elsewhere. And what we're seeing is for those who, have, who are not attending church regularly and are lacking that community, they're tending to draw the boundaries at the level of the nation or at the level of their racial group. Um, now, there was a core group of Trump supporters. This is by no means representative of all of them, but there was a core group of enthusiastic supporters in which many of them believe that to be truly American means you need to be of European descent, which is very troubling, as you can imagine. Um, for these individuals, they were the least likely to go to church. And for them, it seems as though they've redrawn the lines of their community on the basis of immutable traits. Um, and that, I think, is, is toxic to having consensus and compromise and having um, a public policy that works for all people. I think that's playing a role, and we saw that really come out with the 2016 election, particularly when it came to, um, comes to issues of immigration to the country. Mm -hmm. Other comments on this point? Well, so um, I think a lot has gone into the shift in, uh, among Republicans on immigration. Um, one thing that I, th I think happened was that you had for a few years a leadership group among Republicans who were to the left of the party faithful, so to speak. Um, it, if, if we even take left to mean sort of more um, open to high levels of immigration. So for example, almost everybody who ran uh, for the Republican presidential nomination last time was in favor of higher levels of legal immigration. The, the great exceptions to that being Rick Santorum, whose presidential campaign was basically not noticed by anybody, and Trump, uh, who you know sort of took alternate positions on, on even an odd number of days. Um, and that position, the, you know, the favoring um, more immigration is, is something that is favored by a minority of Americans and an even smaller minority of Republicans. Um, in every primary exit poll, you found a majority of Republican voters were in favor of providing a path to citizenship um, rather than deporting all illegal immigrants. But among the people who treated immigration as their top issue, Trump was routinely getting 55% of the vote. That's about 10 or 11% of each primary. That's a significant portion. And then the other thing is, you have a lot of people who are open to a path to citizenship, as I am, for example. It doesn't mean we would be open for, to a path to citizenship unconditionally. It doesn't mean we would be open to doing that before we had seen a demonstrated willingness to enforce the immigration laws of the border in the workplace. And I think you had a lot of concerns among Republican voters in particular that Republican politicians and consultants and media figures were blind to, partly because they misread where public opinion actually was on this. And I think as a result of that, they've created the conditions where you've got a new leadership group in the party that is now, in certain respects, well to the right of where the median Republican voter is. Let me just push back a little bit on that and then ask Mike to comment. If a majority, I saw the same polls, the exit polls, that a majority supported a path to citizenship and uh, still supported some degree of uh, migration and refugee uh, admissions. But that's not the policy of the president they ended up voting for. So is this a case where the president is setting the agenda instead of responding to the ideas? Michael, well, you spent years trying to uh, make policy in this area. What's your take on who, who sets the agenda, who follows, and who's responsible for where we find ourselves? Well, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, the Republican Party uh, may have been to the left of, uh, Republican leaders may have been to the left of the rank and file. Um, 
in this uh, in the Republican coalition. Um, but the Republican Party, by any definition, had a hostile takeover in this last election, okay? uh, with a series of commitments which had seemed uh, Republican commitments that had seemed pretty firmly rooted and crumbled to the touch. Okay? That's true of free trade. It's true of a commitment to refugees. It's true of um, you know uh, trying to get a you know comprehensive immigration reform. These things were uh, not deeply rooted in the Republican coalition. So I, I agree with that. Um, my, my concern is, to, to Ramesh's point, is that there are a lot of prudential issues in these matters. Okay? I mean, whether you support a wall or not at the border is a prudential issue. It's not a good uh, use of resources? Is it an effective policy? Is it going to stop terrorism, which is absurd, but it, you know, is it going to do these things? Those are prudential questions. Mm -hmm. um, when the President of the United States proposes as the policy of the U.S. government the separation of families as a form of deterrence and punishment in the immigration system, that's a violation of human rights. Um, it is not a prudential matter. It's a deeply moral matter. Um, you know, it's something we don't do. And unfortunately, we have a history of doing in the United States. People should be cognizant of the fact that family separation was an essential element of chattel slavery in the United States. Um, and part of my concern has been that a, a lot of evangelical leaders have not seen that distinction. Um, that there are some things that are truly prudential that we can argue, we should have debates and arguments about. Um, but then there are other matters that are not. And my concern is that these are not peripheral to the Trump appeal. Um, I don't think the president has an overriding ideology, but I think he has a certain approach to politics, which is blaming the other for the problems of our country. And that's true of migrants, it's true of Muslims, and it's true of refugees. Um, and so it's a, it's a political approach that I find fundamentally pro problematic from an evangelical perspective and from evangelical kind of history. Um, and I just don't think that, uh, that evangelical leaders have brought that voice to a lot of our debates. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not just, uh, I've already had my say, but let me just, one more point. not just evangelical leaders, right? I mean, this president, as a candidate, openly on national television and repeatedly advocated war crimes, that the U.S. commit war crimes. And I did not see a ton of pushback from religious voices on that. You cover this, Julie. Was there pushback? Is there pushback? I see people in the audience who are pushing back pretty strongly on this. Yeah, I mean, when you Jim Wallace is here, uh, David Hollenbeck, uh, others. Right, it depends who you mean when you talk about religious voices. Um, there's been an awful lot of debate about whether there's such a thing as a religious left. Um, I would say there is. There's a lot of religious voices, whether it's in Muslim and Jewish communities or it's in segments of Catholic Church, absolutely, has been very, very vocal in speaking out against President Trump, especially on immigration. Um, in certain Protestant communities, what I think Ramesh was talking about that is sometimes missing is the, you know, I, it was very interesting to hear about this idea of a moderating effect of religious voters. I think that we don't see that loud and clear very often in religious leaders speaking, and I think if that is true in their voting, then what that suggests is that, okay, there are less religious voters who are choosing immigration as their top issue and voting for Trump, who are choosing some of these other issues that don't appeal to religious voters. If, if that's one segment of the electorate and it's not the religious segment, then what are the reasons that religious voters are choosing to vote for Trump? I would imagine that abortion is high on that list and I was very disappointed after the election in the lack of polling that addressed abortion. I think that it was abortion in the Supreme Court, which are related issues were 
enormously influential in convincing people who otherwise would have found it very distasteful to vote for Trump, thinking, well, that matters so much to so many people that they had to vote to get that Supreme Court seat, to get the policies they wanted on abortion. And there wasn't really polling to demonstrate what, how many people that was the top issue for. If it's not abortion, I'd be very interested in knowing it's, it's apparently not immigration. What are the issues that evangelicals found powerful enough to get that vote? There was a Supreme Court exit poll that, mm -hmm. uh, that suggested that um, something like 21 percent of the public treated that as a top issue, and they broke for Trump, mm -hmm. 55 to 41 percent. So pretty substantial in such a tight race. We may cover some of this in our next discussion. It might not have been how important it was in terms of Trump, but it might have been a response to how important it was to Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. You are in a unique <laughs> position to talk about how. Uh, Sorry. Uh, it's an amber. Yeah. <laughs> Subject to the apocalyptic warning. <laughs> yeah. uh, why people voted for Trump and what were the motivations and uh, how all that worked? Um, I guess uh, the, f the first thing I would say is. Uh, this was absolutely an election not made by Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Okay? Mm -hmm. It was an election created by the uh, untimely death of Antonin Scalia. That, mm -hmm. that was the linchpin of this, of this election. And um, it is, and I can talk about Trump specifically in just a moment, uh, but I, I would say that that was, that was what made this feel existential, right? Because everyone was, and I, you know, you, you could say whether it was, evangelicals felt besieged or there was a real threat or it wasn't a real threat, but I can tell you living in California um, as it related to religious liberty, you know, we, we, were, we were watching, and by the way, moving from Virginia to California and seeing the comparison between the two and the real lack of recourse we had in California to do anything about it. Um, you know, when SB 1146, you know, came up in the State House of California, which was a bill that would have basically made it, you know, very difficult for any uh, religious institution of higher education to, con to, to continue. It was a first step, you know, in, in a, and, ha and that bill would have flown through the State House. It would have, it would have, you know, made it to the Ninth Circuit. For sure the Ninth Circuit would have withheld it, you know, and it's possible that when it got to the Supreme Court, you know, had Hillary Clinton won, you know, the presidency, you know, it, it, it might have been upheld. Now, what caused it to go down? You, know, you, you could say the, the sort of apocalyptic point of view is counterbalanced by the facts of the matter, because the facts were um, that a number of us uh, said, listen, you know, in California, it's just sort of useless to argue on, on the basis of, of religious freedom these days. And so, you know, but what is going to happen is, in order to protect one community, we're going to disenfranchise the two largest minority communities in the state, which is the Hispanic community and the African American community. And, and Bishop Charles Blake and Archbishop Gomez co-wrote an op-ed, um, and the state senator withdrew the bill. Okay, but this was, I, I, if you were paying attention to the evangelical world when this bill was going through, you saw this incredible coalition, an unusual coalition of evangelicals saying, this is a dangerous moment, you know, and joined by, and joined by you know, a number of members of the Catholic uh, community. Secondly, two weeks before the election, you know, we had the Ninth Circuit upheld, uphold uh, this, this bill that was going to require crisis pregnancy centers to recommend abortion to, the, to those who walked in the doors, mm -hmm. right? And so, so you couple that with the fact that we had a lawsuit involving nuns, which you know, this community knows uh, you know, especially clearly, th this slow, and I think from a, you know, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not progressive in my, in my politics, but if I was, I would say that Obama did an incredible disservice to his own community by pressing too much, too fast, too quickly. You know, and, and what, what ended up happening is he created an environment um, where uh, it did feel like there was, this was sort of the end of it all you know, for, for, this, for this community. And so what became a, what, you know, the sort of feeling of an existential threat as it related to, to religious liberty, coupled with um, the binary choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and then evangelicals started spending time with Donald Trump. You know, and, they, and they started getting a sense that as, an, as a community of outs, I, you know, and, and Michael would know this better than I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I was born in 1983, right? So I don't, you know, I don't know so much of the history of the uh, uh, Republican Party recent elections. But what, what I do know, what I do know is, at least in my community, we often thought of evangelicalism as we were outsiders to the Republican Party. We were outsiders. We had to fight to get in. First time this election ever, um, you know, it, it was like an outsider candidate with an outsider uh, community, and we just started talking shop. And so when Donald Trump called us, 
and asked if we would put together a group of evangelical advisors you know, to, to um, uh, provide advice to the, to the campaign, my, my first statement was, well, are they required to endorse you? I said, no, they're not required to endorse me. No, this is not about you know, taking a pick. And I said, well, what about a Monday call every single Monday? And not, not dial star seven in order to ask your question, which is moderated by some, but an open call. We have an open conversation that happened every single Monday. You know, and so when I've been with Donald Trump you know, and, and this group of evangelicals that, that um, you know, he's, he's become close to, I mean, th there's a genuine conversation, a genuine relationship. And by the way, it's not that this community doesn't criticize him. It's just that the community, you know, the, the Bible tells me that you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, but it doesn't say it has to be in bold 32-point font on the front page of the New York Times. You know, I, I, I think that you know, this, this is a community that has stayed... Um, that in a particular environment, a particular time, a series of circumstances um, created an unlikely alliance, and there was a lot of pessimism about how that alliance would play itself out. And what has happened is again and again and again, we found that this, there's this strange politician that generally has kept his promises to our community, and I, you know, which, is a, which is an unusual characteristic for a, a politician. Mm -hmm. If I could just add a little data sure. to this, to, to kind of both of what you were saying. Um, so let's be clear that evangelical churchgoers are not the base of the Trump uh, coalition by any means. The more likely you were to go to church, the more likely you were to vote for Cruz in the primaries, not Trump. In fact, it was the opposite. The, you know, if you didn't go to church very often at all, you were the most likely to vote for Trump. Um, and then even today, the more you go to church, the less favorable you are of Trump today. By about 20 points, people who go to church um, more than once a week are about 20 points less likely than those, again, these are Republican conservative voters, um, are about 20 points less likely to say they're very favorable of Donald Trump. But the question you have to ask is, well, if it weren't Trump, who would it be? And we have to remember that partisanship plays a powerful role in how people are going to vote. And at the end of the day, even if Trump wasn't your, if you're an evangelical voter and a devout person that goes to church every Sunday or even more often than once a week, who do you pick? You're a Republican voter, do you, um, and Trump isn't your favorite, do you vote for Hillary Clinton? And, and like what the Reverend said, um, where many evangelicals feel like they are besieged and religious liberty seems to be at stake, do you vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? Again, partisanship, I think, is the answer to Julia, Julia to your question about, well, then why did so many evangelicals vote for him? But there, there was something dis distinctly different, though. Um, when, when it, you know, the evangelical, I don't know if you could say there's an evangelical political establishment. I guess you could. Uh, they were largely in line with Ted Cruz. I mean, this was, you know, this was the first time ever I, I was invited to a number of these meetings. I sat in a number of these meetings. And you know, it was this concerted effort uh, from the right-wing side of the you know, evangelical community to consolidate around one or two candidates. It was going to be Rand Paul or Ted Cruz. And in the end, they landed on Ted Cruz. And, and which, which, is, which is also interesting that Rand Paul was in, you know, there's stuff going on in that, in, that way, in that way of thinking. But the leaders that sat around the, there, there were two things that pulled evangelicals away from, away from Cruz in the direction of, direction of Trump. Number one is, you know, it was, the, it was the evangelical pastor, not the evangelical political activist in this city that moved his congregation to the polls, even, even when it was a nonpartisan way. You know, this time, you know, there was this, it was the average or mega church pastor, not the activist class in the city. And the relationship, by the way, has maintained its identity outside of the Beltway and in Middle America. And the second thing, just an observation about Trump versus Cruz, you know, Cruz, uh, while a very principled conservative, you know, always pervade this sort of inauthenticity uh, oftentimes. And it's, it, it's, he's, he's a, you know, that's not to say anything about his policy. Or anything. It's just, you know, he's a, he's a very good politician. He's a very good lawyer. And he's, and Trump just said what he thought. And you could argue with him. And he would, you know, you'd go back and forth with him. And he, you sort of knew what you were getting. Help, help me with, th this is very helpful to understand. Uh, I, Richard John Newell said, uh, a while ago, there was a Catholic moment. Well, I'm on a Catholic moment for this thing uh, in a second, but, and it's not just directed at Johnny, but I, Michael said, you know, a sentence that it's hard to imagine we would say, that the president paid off a porn star, and 
people, religious people, have stuck with him. People talked about Mulligans. They talked about he's not our pastor, but the he's, in he's the like Catholic, King David. Hmm? He's he's like King David. We've heard that yeah, yeah. analogy work out a lot. In the Catholic community, uh, there's a line in Faithful Citizenship says character integrity matters. Uh, there has been a long strain in evangelical politics and any kind of religious conviction that the question of who you are is reflected in what you do. So I'm not asking you or anybody else to defend the behavior. Help us understand what's going on. I'll take that up just for a moment. Look, I think a lot of people recognize that the president is a low life, uh, <laughs> but we're willing to support him despite but, that but for I any think, number me, of reasons. Me, I'm sorry, but let me just interrupt for just a second. Like, that is inside the Beltway speak. It's no, I think yeah, people yeah, use that phrase the, outside the Beltway no, but as well. I, I, no, I, well, but to the, I think to so many Americans attending a church in middle America, there's this thing that is, that is it's part of the Americana where it's like you might agree or disagree with the president's policies or even his lifestyle or his previous lifestyle or his present tweets. But, but you, you talk about the presidents of the United States in a, in a in a respectful way. And I think that, that part, part of this, you know, gets at this sort of, this. Like Obama? <laughs> yeah, no, well, and, and as they should. I'm, yeah, I'm no, so I'm just saying, yeah, I, listen, I'm not, argue, I'm not even arguing the point. I'm just saying the incredulity of the response of this audience is precisely what the problem is, because there's this massive gap uh, between so many of the everyday masses in this country that have such a distrust of the city and in Donald Trump, they found someone who just sort of authentically said what was on his mind. So, like, it or look, not. first of all, I just think that's false, right? I mean, he doesn't speak his mind. He lies all the time at an unbelievably rapid clip, flagrantly, checkably. He says things authentically from moment to moment that contradict each other. It is true he speaks authentically if we define authentic as being not rest being restrained by norms of decency, manners, and politesse. And some people do positively respond to that. I'll agree with that. But let's be accurate about the actual phenomenon that is going on here. The fact of the matter is, it is a minority of Americans who will say that they think of the president as a good role model for children, that they think of him as honest, that they think of him as decent, that they think of him as sharing their values. There is a significant number of Americans who will give him a decent job approval rating even while affirming each of the things I have just said, that he is not a good role model, he is not honest, et cetera. My concern is that given the fact that you've got a majority of the American public who recognizes the president for what he is at the level of character, a lot of these caveats and hemming and hawing that you hear from his supporters, uh, we support him transactionally, I'm not sure that's coming across. I think that a lot of people have rationalized, they've started with, well, He's not perfect, but he's my guy, he's better than Clinton. And then they start minimizing the flaws. They start looking for reasons to ignore people who are bringing unflattering stories about him to attention. On and on, they come up with, what about the other guy? He's even worse, or he did some bad thing that is somewhat okay. comparable to that. And then you have moved towards rationalizing him, and I think that it's coming across in a way that is very bad for the future of the social right, both Catholic and evangelical, in a way that is exacerbating an already wide generation gap within the evangelical world. That, I think, is the question that Michael was raising. What is the long-term trajectory that this puts us on as conservatives? It's an open question, and there is reason for worry. Yeah. We promise diverse points of view, and yeah, <laughs> we're getting that. Let, uh, let's talk about Catholics. Julie, you just uh, wrote a piece about the firing of uh, uh, a former chaplain here at Georgetown. Uh, Father Pat Conroy uh, well, started the retreat program here at Georgetown. Uh, there, you know, nobody gets served for chaplain forever, but this seemed particularly badly handled, and then people made it worse by what they said uh, privately and publicly. Uh, this seems in many ways to be the evangelical moment, for good or ill. There are not a lot of Catholics advising uh, hierarchs or uh, leaders advising uh, the president or, for that matter, the party. What was your sense as somebody who covers 
all these communities of where the Catholic community fits within this moment in the Republican Party. That it, you brought up one thing that is very striking. Every president for the past many, many years has had faith advisors. Um, and President Trump just created a somewhat new office for faith-based partnerships. But until this point, what has been different about President Trump's faith advisors is that he has had Johnny's Evangelical Council, and that's it. There has not been any formal or informal faith advisors from any other faith, um, which is very different and unusual. And Cardinal Whirl here in Washington has been open about saying that he has not had the sort of access to the White House that he's had in previous White Houses to you know, bring things up that often the White House doesn't necessarily agree with or listen to, but that there is not that channel to the Catholic community that there has been. Um, in terms of what happened with the House chaplain, who Father Conroy, who is a Jesuit priest, a Catholic chaplain, um, his accusation when he, so Paul Ryan dismissed the chaplain and Father Conroy said that he thought that this was anti-Catholic bias, that he thought he was being targeted because he identified with Pope Francis and he's a Jesuit and a close follower of Pope Francis, which means talking about climate change, talking about refugees, talking about immigration, a lot of issues that to a Jesuit priest are not necessarily political issues, they're issues that the Pope is talking about. To a congressman might sound like you're talking politics and you're talking democratic politics. Um, whether that is why he was dismissed, it, there's a lot of opinions, it's hard to know. Um, only Paul Ryan really knows why he did what he did. And Paul Ryan, of course, is Catholic himself and it's hard to believe he would have anti-Catholic bias, though he might not be the biggest fan of Pope Francis. Um, he said that there were issues with pastoral services um, after Father Conroy spoke up and argued against his dismissal. He was actually reinstated, so he is the House Chaplain again. Um, and we might not get much more of an answer than that. But it definitely has raised some questions about how members of the House view a Pope Francis Catholic nowadays. And you know, one congressman said, you know, I think the next chaplain should be a man with a family who can talk about what it's like to raise children, which of course would rule out Catholic priests, which struck a lot of people the wrong way. Um, it, it we'll get a former Anglican. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, they're, they're, all right, it would not rule out every Catholic priest. <laughs> basically rule them out. Um, so the, the question of whether, whether Pope Francis is viewed as a political figure, whether that means that Catholics more broadly are viewed as liberal is, is an interesting one, even if the chaplain's back and we might not hear it again for a while. Johnny, you have a reputation uh, in your religious freedom work and lots of other work, working on an interfaith basis, building bridges. What's your take on relationships between the evangelical Catholic community, the place of different groups, in the Republican Party, in the ecumenical community. You built these alliances of all your life. Yeah, I, well, first of all, I'm not that optimistic about the Republican Party, period, nor am I optimistic about the Democratic uh, Party. I, you know, we, as we've tried to work on these you know, issues that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, we've often met trouble with, within the own party. And so I, you know, I, I, don't know about, I don't know about the party. What, what I do know is, um, that if we just change our thinking, right, and if we recognize that most of the issues that we point at the White House for are actually issues that only Congress can solve, right, if we disconnect ourselves from the, uh, the punditry and as religious leaders resist the temptation to be pundits, which is one of the reasons why a number of evangelical leaders have, have uh, not infrequently gotten themselves in trouble, um, and then just work on the issues of mutual concern, there's a lot of stuff that we can get done. I mean, this is the thing, you know, there's a, uh, uh, a rabbi a friend of mine um, in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, 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 quoted to me something from Ethics of Our Fathers, uh, which says, um, uh, it, is, you know, it is not up to you to complete the task, nor are you free to desist from it, right? And, and my, my way of thinking of these things is, um, you know, whatever's on the news or whatever people are discussing, that is, those are all just distractions, okay? 
and we have to focus on areas of mutual concern, and we have to move forward together. And if we can just push all that aside and, and decide, like this very week, right? I mean, I was, I was, I was in the blue room of, of, uh, uh, of the White House at last National Day of Prayer, sitting around a table um, with uh, Jared and Ivanka and Samuel Rodriguez and George Wood of the Assemblies of God and Harry Jackson and Franklin Graham's daughter, Sissy, Bishop Harry Jackson, um, it's Pastor Tom Mullins and Jay Strack, we were at one table with Jared Navanka, and then the president was over here, the vice president was over there, there's about 50 of us together, the eve of the National Day of Prayer, and we start talking about criminal justice reform around that table. And it turns out you know, that, that, um, that this, is a, this is an issue that Jared Kushner is deeply passionate about. It's an issue that all of us around the table are deeply passionate about. And on that very evening, we start talking about what we can do, what we can do together. You know, on this issue. And I, I, think as, I think there is this unbelievable temptation in the culture we're living in where you have to have an opinion on everything, you know, and, and where, where we too easily just sort of boil down everybody into these uh, automatons as to what we think, you know, they think. And, and there are so many experts that tell us what we think, but if we just get down to the very, very simple things of, of, of picking an issue and just working for a period of time together on that issue. For me, like this whole month, it's prison reform. That's the only thing I'm focused on. You know, and, and you can call me a thousand times and other people, and I'm just not going to talk about hardly anything unless I have to because this is my focus. And I'm doing it with rabbis and with, with members of the Catholic community and others. Like this is something that we share together. You know, we can move forward on this together. And I think we have to resist the temptation to punditry and, and we have to stop letting Congress play this game. They're playing with Trump and they played with Obama and they played with Bush and it just goes all the way, all the way back where it's every time they get under heat, they point at the White House, you know? And if our, if, if, when it comes to immigration, the only way, you know, wherever you are on the spectrum, everyone agrees the system's broken, okay? The system's mm. broken. And, and it's only Congress that can solve it, you know? So, so what if we just spent a lot less time talking about whatever's going on and, other, and we just move together and focus together? And what I found is, uh, I, as a general rule, if somebody says something negative, um, uh, about me or about us, I try to reach out uh, to, that, to that person, and I fail at it you know, sometimes, but I try most of the time. And what I find almost, we just did it, by the way, with North Korea. Um, okay. uh, it, it, with North Korea, we just united to get Jim Wallace and Pastor Jack Graham and myself and Greg Laurie and, and uh, a hundred of us, we all gathered together and we called for prayer for peace on the North Korean Peninsula. And we're, I think we're in a room of a lot of believers, and I'm not, you know, not, you know I, I, I don't mean to like pick a party of the Red Sea every minute, but you could almost simultaneously line up the thawing of the whole conversation when we finally laid down the, the, the it, it, there's, this, there's this documentarian in Hollywood who says, okay, I'll say it. Who says, the beginning of tyranny is the lack of nuance. You know, and that's what, that's what we argue about you know, all the time. But we just get together, we be in something, we pray together, things start, things start happening. And all of a sudden, the World Council of Churches is, is praising something that this group, 25 conservative evangelicals, along with people, all you know, this is what changes the world. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> uh, when I worked at the Bishop's Conference, uh, I thought we should put a sign outside uh, our building there that says, nuances are us. Uh, because of the way in which Catholic social teaching. Michael, you have put together coalitions across lines, evangelical. You know more about Catholic social teaching than most Catholics. <laughs> How do, what is the role of the Catholic Church within your party, within our country at this point, when so much of the focus is elsewhere? And then I'm gonna ask people to begin to move towards the, uh, the microphones, and I would also say you can join our conversation at GUCST Public Life at our hashtag Faith in Politics. So, Michael, uh, reflect on your work with the Catholic community, with Catholic social teaching, and the role of the Catholic Church in politics and in this party. Well, you know, I've argued in the past that the great <clears throat> advantage of Catholic social teaching um, that fills a need for evangelicals, actually, is the if-then nature of Catholic teaching. So if you are pro-life, then you can't dehumanize migrants. Okay? If you oppose euthanasia, then you have to support health care for, for all people in, in whatever way that's possible. Okay? Um, and you know, Catholics don't always obey that, 
um, clearly in, in public life, but they have it. Um, and I'm afraid that often uh, evangelicals have approached a lot of these questions from the perspective of the perceived aggressions of modernity on abortion or religious liberty or other things, rather than looking at first principles and coming to issues of human dignity. Um, and there's some overlap between those two things, but it's, they're not uh, identical necessarily to one another. Um, I also, so, you know, so I think there's an important role there. I would also be just a voice in this broader debate about how you get things done in Washington. Um, that if you're going to make utilitarian arguments, then it, you have to make them all the way down, okay? Because I, there's no doubt that evangelicals on their agenda, Supreme Court nominees and other things, um, have gained things, okay? Um, my concern, like for the pro-life community in both Catholics and uh, evangelicals, um, because I'm, I'm strongly pro-life, is that if the pro-life cause becomes identified with misogyny, for example, that undermines the long-term ability to make arguments that persuade the public to support these, these causes. You know, the whole idea of family values gets undermined when there is um, tolerance for uh, cruelty and, um, and crudity and anger. Um, and so, you know, I think you just have to say, if you're gonna total up all the gains and losses of this type of engagement, there are huge risks that evangelicals and Christians more broadly are taking right now. Um, that they, their movement will be seen as identical to um, something that is very different in values and in or kind of goal from their approach. And, you know, for me, this is why um, evangelicals are not just another interest group among many, like a business organization or union okay, with a set of interests. These are leaders that also in their normal life are, are uh, you know, supporting the reputation of the Christian gospel. Um, and I'm afraid are making decisions that are alienating the young, making decisions that are alienating minorities from these messages, um, and doing some very serious long-term damage to the, to the causes that um, evangelicals have cared about for a long time. Questions? Uh, join us. Uh, we would ask you to uh, put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank Identify you. Identify yourself if you can over here. Uh, my name is Bob Lannan. I'm an alumnus of the college and the law school, and I teach in the School of Foreign, uh, Speak Continuing up just Studies. A little more. I'm sorry, can you hear me more? Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if any of the panelists or anybody in the audience saw in the New York Times about two months ago a column by Nicholas Kristof called, And Jesus Said Unto Paul Ryan. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a conversation between Christ and the speaker. And every time Jesus spoke, he linked to scripture. And I, it kept me awake at night because I'm a conservative and it was, you know, a little Catholic guilt going off. <laughs> yeah. And his premise was that yeah. Republican policy is anti-Christian. And, of course, at the end he goes to the final exam we're all going to take on our judgment day. When I was naked, did you give me clothes? When I was, the evangelicals can quote it because you know scripture better than me, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> and, and, and in essence, Paul's kind of left. He says, well, you know, you know I, I disagreed with these programs for these reasons. Well, anyway, Christoph, um, Christoph condemns him. Here's the question. Do we do enough as conservatives for the poor? And if the answer is we do, why don't people know that? Is there more we can do as conservatives to make people mindful that we care about the poor as Christians. I'm going to take a couple at a time. Go ahead. 
All right, thanks guys for joining us. Uh, my name is Max. I am a senior studying theology and government here at Georgetown. Uh, so my question concerns the, uh, the topic of moderation and immigration slash refugee policy. Is Emily, you presented uh, some data. Uh, Reverend Johnny, you yourself presented some anecdotes that there's this gap between what we imagine evangelicals um, believe, but yet the actual believers are this moderating voice. But I mean, if I turn on TV, the voices of you know Jerry Falwell Jr., Billy Graham Jr., even um, Governor Pence at Indiana at the time got in a huge public dispute with then Archbishop Tobin on the issue of refugees. So where is where is this gap between sort of the public evangelical voice that I'm familiar with, probably most of us are familiar with, and what's actually going on at the pews? Is it the pastors? Is there another voice that's this moderating aspect? I'm just interested to hear your thoughts. Thanks. One more, and then we'll ask awesome. the panel to come in. Identify Great. yourself. And uh, your I'm sorry, David Amena. So my question is for Reverend Moore. You refer to kind of this language of evangelicals feel, feeling, fairly or not, um, an existential threat to their existence. But obviously there's been many uh, communities in the United States, most notably African Americans, who have certainly felt that feeling as well in the history of our country. Uh, and yet we've condemned parts of that community when they've supported uh, either violence or, in kind of the case of now, political demagogues like, say, Louis Farrakhan. So is it fair to basically say that, I guess, to push against what you were saying earlier, given the fact that evangelical Christians have not been remotely in the situations that those communities have faced, that they've not resorted to any of kind of the mass nonviolent resistance that those communities have had to endure and to push themselves through, um, to kind of sign up for the most, you know, a demagogic alternative as opposed to the hard work of resisting nonviolently the threats that you outline. Sure. A lot to work with. Uh, conservatives and the poor, are we visible enough? Migration and immigration, are the other voices strong enough? And given the, the history of race and oppression and besiegement in our country, have religious people stood up? Clearly enough. Comments from the panel, and then we'll go back to the question. Well, I'll say really briefly, just add in some data to answer the first data. question. Data. The, the first question about um, conservatives. Um, data shows that conservatives donate more to charitable causes than liberals, even when you account for differences in income. So you might say, oh, well, maybe conservatives make more money on average, and that's why they donate more. Even when you account for those differences, there are differences in charitable donations. Um, that's not to say more can always be done, right, from all accounts, but there's probably disagreements about what level, uh, th through what mechanism is charitable giving, or through what mechanism do you help people in poverty, is it through charity, through government, and so forth, but just wanted to add that little bit of interesting data that there are differences in charitable giving by ideology. So, um, uh, Roma. The Langer and Associates last week had this huge survey of the religious landscape in America, and they find, as everybody has, that nuns are growing, people without religious affiliation. Let's clarify <laughs> what we mean by nuns. People with no <laughs> religious affiliation. Um, but, uh, and, uh, and a group that is leading the decline of religion is white evangelical Protestants. They are shrinking very rapidly. Um, there is some reason to think that one of the things that is led to the rise of the nuns, contributed to the rise of the nuns, is the idea that there is too tight an alliance between the evangelical church and conservative politics, that there's a particular kind of rigid cultural and political stereotype that is driving a lot of people away. That is a long-standing problem, I think, for my evangelical conservative friends. It is a problem that I think is getting very significantly worse right now. Okay. Uh, just short answers. Uh, no, we don't do enough for the poor, but we do far more for the poor than we get credit for, I think is the way of putting it. Um, you know, with, uh, uh, I, I don't you know, quite, quite recall the structure of the refugee question, but what occurred to me when it was being asked, um, it was, it, I think a lot of this comes down to uh, not the passion for the problem, but the solutions that are chosen. You know, and evangelicals, uh, tend to be more locally oriented, which I think really complements you know, Catholic social, social teaching. And this is also why I think we're less concerned about you know, these sort of overarching ideas about the throwing away the reputation of all evangelicals because of this, that, or the other. 
as I think most evangelical pastors, while they're you know, most repeatedly you know, talked about in the public square when, with regard to politics, they spend 90% of their time locally serving people doing all these ministries. I think that's where it's all, um, it's all worth. And on the, on the existential threat uh, point, uh, it's, a very, it's a very good point. I, I would say that um, you know, ev evangelicals are very, as I am, very involved with issues of religious persecution around the world, and that certainly informs the way that we approach these policy you know, types of things. It would be absurd to say there's any form of religious persecution in this country comparable to what's happening around the world. Um, but you, know, you sit down with a Christian, as I have, in northern Iraq or, you know, th or throughout the Middle East, and they'll say, you know, it began by this and it ended this. Now, I don't think that can happen here. I think we have all the safeguards and everything in place, but I think it informs the way we think about these things. Uh, but there is no comparison between the experience of, of uh, these communities uh, and in our community, I just tend to think of it as it's all of the above. It's not either or. We're all working on these individual things in the community, and it all sort of comes together. You know? Julie, your mic. Yeah, I would just add, um, as far as evangelical priorities, um, right now there's a significant amount of priority placed on uh, pluralism, um, and I think appropriately. So I want to argue that that is important. I think that individual rights of conscience are guaranteed in institutions that reflect their values, institutions that can educate their children. Um, and now that, uh, I think, is an important element that um, conservatives should be concerned about, particularly civic, civil society conservatives who are concerned about the health of the civic sector. Religious liberty is an essential commitment there. Um, but I would just add to that, related to the question, that the ultimate distinctive, Christian distinctive in political life is not pluralism. It's personalism. It's the view that every human being has rights and dignity, yeah. including the weakest members of the human family. Um, and I think sometimes that gets lost um, in, a, in an environment where there are genuine challenges to religious liberty. But if uh, evangelical Christians are concerned primarily about their own rights. It is a misrepresentation of their most basic responsibilities. Um, and we, we risk that sometimes. So. I'm going to go to uh, Jim Wallace. We talked about many religious voices. Jim is one of the most powerful uh, religious voices. We've worked together in the circle of protection. He has been Part of the resistance we've talked about, welcome. I honestly came tonight to listen and learn and not to speak, but Reverend Moore invoked me here and pointed at me, so <laughs> let me ask you a question back. First of all, we'll see I, if that was a mistake yeah. or not. Yeah. <laughs> you, you uh, I'm glad that. to hear prison reform yeah. is one of your issues. I really am. And uh, since you say people that don't agree often don't talk, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and we'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll ask you why the attorney. General is so opposed to prison reform. We can have that conversation. Um, I want to just say that whenever you say evangelical, as I've heard you saying, given the way you talk about we evangelicals, you have to say white evangelicals before every time you say evangelicals, because that's what you're talking about. And uh, there was a phone call right after the election, I remember, that I was on with evangelicals, uh, black and white and Hispanic, and um, the white evangelical said, well, we didn't vote for Donald Trump because of his racial bigotry. It was for other reasons. And the black evangelical said, so I guess his, his racial bigotry wasn't a deal breaker for you. And the New York Times has reported this mass exodus of African Americans from evangelical mega churches, even multicultural churches, because of the election. And the feeling that's named by black church members is betrayal. And most black churches, while they don't like the word evangelical because of how white evangelicals have shaped it, they're deeply evangelical in their theology. And so there's a real racial difference here and a racial divide that I've never seen stronger than than during the civil rights movement. And I'll just stand with Michael and say, 
how I think biblically, how we treat the vulnerable is the most important political question always. Do we humanize, are they made in the image of God? Racial bigotry is an assault on the image of God. The way we talk about the stranger. So these are gospel issues. So I, you know, I actually was concerned about the California issues that you mentioned before. If a Democrat had won, that had been my first conversation about those, those issues. And I am pro-life too. Cardinal Bernadine shaped my view of being pro-pro-life. But I resist with all my being to not be religious left because there are ways that my being evangelical makes me critical of the left, lots of ways. Uh, and I hope you would be not religious right, but your gospel commitments would have you raise those hard questions. And, and I guess uh, my question is, what would you say to that black evangelical on the phone who said, I guess religious bigotry trumps clear racial bigotry, not religious, racial, trumps clear racial bigotry, which is, I think, undeniable, why that isn't a deal breaker for Trump evangelicals. Okay. We're going to take the last two and then we'll close with responses to these. Uh, so I'm uh, Cliff, a Georgetown graduate and a recent and current student, a faithful Catholic and uh, politically homeless. Um, <laughs> My question concerns the political philosophy formerly known as conservatism, uh, which in our public discourse seems to have been completely uh, taken over by uh, Trumpism. And so my question is, what does the faithful conservative or the thoughtful conservative do to resist or push back against this takeover? And might the strategy be to abandon the term and come up with a new one? Okay, and our last question. Hi, uh, my name is Josh Dill, um, and I also have a question about the philosophy formerly known as conservatism. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who insists that it's important to remember that before Trump defeated the Democrats in 2016, he defeated the entire Republican Party, 15 candidates or something like that. Um, and when I think about the uh, kind of triad of classic Reagan era conservatism, um, I think of social conservatism, but also kind of free market um, neoliberal capitalism and um, an interventionist foreign policy. So was there a change in religious attitudes towards those things? Thanks. So three questions really about definition and uh, accountability. Uh, what do white evangelicals say to black evangelicals? what became of conservatism, I would add compassionate conservatism, and then broader philosophically, uh, how, do we, how do we go forward in this environment we find ourselves? And I would ask you to make your responses to this to be your final comment. So, who wants to jump in? Well, I can. Julie? Um, I, I was struck by, I think it was Cliff, your phrase, you said you were politically homeless. Um, and I am interested in the large number of religious people who fall in that category and also the growing number of people of faith who find themselves religiously homeless, to use that term. That they are ex-evangelicals or they don't go to church anymore. Um, the Public Religion Research Institute did a study a couple of years ago, I think right before the 2016 election, um, asking people who used to be religiously affiliated and are not anymore, which is a rapidly growing number of people, why not? And some of them said they stopped believing or they didn't find a church they felt comfortable in. But I think it was about 30% that specifically said LGBT issues. Their church wasn't welcoming to LGBT people and they left their church. 30% of people who left their churches, that's a huge portion, and that's one issue. And now, in the Trump administration, there are so many more issues that people of faith have taken issue with the stance that their church has taken because their church has stood implicitly or explicitly with President Trump. Um, those people who are religiously homeless now, I'm very interested in figuring out where those people go. Um, where they go religiously, where they go politically. So they're not going to just all turn around and become Democrats. There's gotta be 
a third place, and I don't know what that's going to be. And I think that's the big question looking forward to 2020 and beyond, is where do the disaffiliated end up? Ramesh? So uh, in response to the two questions about sort of the, what is conservatism anymore, um, I would say that the evanescence of compassionate conservatism is an argument for the contestability of Trumpism. So in George W. Bush, uh, his entire first term, he had as high or higher support from Republicans than Trump has now. He wins re-election. He wins the only majority of the national popular vote that any Republican has managed since the end of the Cold War. Um, and yet, compassionate conservatism is basically, let's just say it has not defined the future of the Republican Party. Uh, on the, you know, looking at it from the other angle, after 2008, there was a lot of talk about how the, the end of the Bush years was going to be this discrediting event in American politics for the Republican Party, the Republicans. It was going to be like the, the Hoover years. It was going to be very hard to recover from. Um, James Carville wrote a book called 40 More Years, whose thesis I think you can guess from the title. And eight years later, Republicans have most state legislatures, governorships, the White House, both houses of Congress. Um, that I think suggests that these parties are pliable. Their definitions are not set in stone. And one thing that helps in terms of contesting it is that Trumpism doesn't actually have any stable meaning. Johnny? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, so, and yeah. Catholic theology, uh, this means less time in purgatory for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the first thing I'll say is um, I, uh, I wasn't on the call, but I listened to the call almost immediately, and I was invited to be on the call. Um, and the reason, why, the reason why I did that is because one of the things that I, um, I think I know and I think I live is um, that what matters more than what you say is what people hear from what, from what you say. And um, it, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, that evangelicalism has had a race problem from the very, very beginning. Uh, and th this is not... Um, this is, uh, you know, if we think that, uh, that this problem is new, we, or if it's um, uh, uh, unique, unique to this time, it isn't. You know, and what, what, I, what, I would, what I would say to that, um, to that person, and I'll give you, a, a, you know, a, a few bits of information in a moment, but what I'd say to that, that pastor is, we're not offering you a seat at our table, we want a seat at your table, precisely to listen, and to figure out what we can do to make a difference. And I'll tell you, one of the most disappointing moments for me in this whole thing, as someone who, I, I, have, I don't have a position, I don't have, I, 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 and I don't want one, by the way. Uh, I, I, I have, uh, with three young kids, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old, taking red eyes to this city every chance I can to try to make a difference. Uh, when, when the incident in Charlottesville had ha happened, okay, I'll just bring it up, uh, I, I, there were a few things colliding in my mind. Number one, in my interactions with the president himself, I had never seen anything in the direction of racism whatsoever, not a thing. I still haven't, by the way, in, a, in an interpersonal level. Uh, number two, um, I was so incredibly grieved by, by, by what happened. You can go back, you can look at, you know, we were all condemning bigotry immediately. Immediately we were out there, and anti-Semitism. We were all issuing statements. What we wouldn't do is disband. And the reason why we wouldn't disband, and I'll get to the disappointing moment in a minute, and I'll wrap it up. Um, but uh, we wouldn't disband because, first of all, we didn't exist. There is no formal board. Okay? It never existed to begin with, but this informal group. In a moment of national crisis like this, it would be dereliction of our duty to disband in that moment. Like, this, is, this is when you want spiritual leaders, even if you disagree with them stepping into it. You know, and we weren't like a business council that had fiduciary responsibilities and all this stuff. I mean, we were, you know, we were religious leaders, and so we had conversations, and we were, we were involved in it in the most disappointing moment. And I don't judge this person for it at all, because I know it's not what you say, it's what people hear. But I wrote a very, very prominent member um, of, of the African-American uh, community who was deeply hurt by it, and I said, I will meet, as God is my witness, and I don't know we can say that, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I will meet you wherever, whenever, name the time so we can work together on healing this. And the email I got back was, he wouldn't meet me. And I don't judge him for it. I don't judge him, I'm gonna be clear, because I don't know how deep that pain was. But what I do know is that a week before Charlottesville, I was in a meeting at the White House, 
we had compiled a list of the 100 most influential African American leaders, regardless of their party, whatever, and we were planning on inviting them to the White House the week after the Charlottesville incident. That person was on that list. But then we couldn't do it because it would be perceived as a political action. It would put people in a difficult situation where they had to protest by not coming. What I can tell you is in the last month, we've had over 200 uh, leaders uh, between meetings face to face in the White House or on phone calls. It's just happening quietly, right? Uh, one fact. Yes, sir. One, one member of your Okay. Yeah, and I, it's not something to address here, but it's a this. Uh, it's a well, but it's it's uh, uh, it's an in, it's it's incomplete, but it's not for here to address. Yeah. You want to respond to <laughs> all that? I guess I'll <laughs> say two things. So public opinion research has long shown that there are different opinions about how you define racism and bigotry, and conservatives tend to define it differently than liberals. And what we've seen in the data is that many conservatives genuinely did not view Trump's comments as bigoted. Um, while that may seem strange to many people, there was just genuine um, kind of a disbelief. Um, so I think that's part of it. So a broader conversation needs to take place about, well, what is bigotry and racism today? Um, and how does that affect people? Um, and then completely unrelated, uh, just my other final comment that I'd like to make, um, kind of bringing it back to kind of the issue of religion and tolerance. I think that over the past um, maybe decade or so, um, because of the conflict between um, the respect for the rights of LGBT people and just kind of general civic respect for these individuals and how that's often come into conflict with religious conscience, that there has been kind of this shift in um, kind of a demonization and kind of culture more broadly against organized religion and people of faith. Um, and I think that I can understand wh where that's coming from, but I would argue that that is misplaced because of the data that I mentioned today, that religion, that organized religion can also be a source of moderation that actually can bring people together in surprising ways. Um, it doesn't seem to be that way on LGBT issues specifically, but it can be on very important issues of immigration, criminal justice reform, poverty, and matters of racial tolerance. And those issues also matter, and so that I would hope that there could be a broader conversation about how um, kind of less demonization of organized religion in civil society and also seeing it as a source for good for both left, right, libertarian, and so forth. Michael. Um, I would say just two words in favor of uh, compassionate conservatism, <laughs> um, which was raised earlier. Um, we just had a very upbeat meeting in our phone booth. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do actually think that, um, that there is an enduring role for a conservatism of the common good. Mm. The application of conservative and free market ideas to issues of social justice. Um, and that's going to be there no matter what it's called. Um, and that's a hopeful thing. And there are brilliant people involved in that set of issues, including the person at the end of the table here. Um, and so I, I think that's rather hopeful. But I would just conclude on one idea um, that religious people, I think, should bring to the debate a little bit. Um, and that is a, a understanding of the nature of power and influence. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a worldly definition of organization and the exercise of power. Um, but when I look at the moment that Christian people communicated most about their, the nature of their faith over the last several years, it was after the Charleston church shootings. Yeah. Okay. When the families of those who had suffered forgave the man who had taken their family members. Um, and it was an example of grace, not anger. Grace, not resentment. You know, grace, not organization for power. Um, and that's the comparative advantage that Christians have, I think, in the broader culture. 
is that when they act by the values and attitudes that characterized Jesus Christ, it speaks across every boundary. Um, it reaches people of every background. Um, and I think that, I think we just need to be cognizant of where the true power lies.